Right. Kia ora koutou. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're heading into the fifth of our five pre-Christmas LTP amendment workshops. So um, it also follows on from your discussion about the landfill um, earlier today. The purpose of today is to discuss and then to ensure that we've understood your initial indications about funding envelopes and options to guide preparation of draft consultation material throughout January. Uh, this presentation is also in your portal, so you can um, see the detail. So where we are and where we need to get to. We're right in the detail, informing the options the community will be asked to consider and to provide feedback on during consultation. Before leaving today, we'll seek your direction about options to develop further for consultation with the community. We'll seek initial indications of preferred options. A preferred option is something that's required in the Local Government Act for this, consul these, this consultation. And so a reminder that these are indications, they're not decisions, and we'll bring back them back to you in the new year for formal consul consideration. There's a lot to cover today, um, and so we've broken it into sections um, to hopefully set it out nicely for you. First, um, Daniel will talk about three waters and options there. Following that, Jacinta will um, take us through wider budgets um, and cover all of the items there. Then also lead into the rates review. And uh, I'll come back about the consultation document preparation and communications and engagement in 2023. So I'll pass over to Daniel. Good afternoon. I should have probably learned from the landfill um, process around calling things options too early. Um, so we have had a number of discussions in the last few weeks around options for three waters, um, considering the, the NTU and also how we approach the LTP process. So for looking backwards, if we could sort of reference those as scenarios that we've looked at, and really today is about the emerging options that we're seeking direction on to go out to the community. So very much um, future focus, looking to, to hone in the reference to options um, at the point where we're, we're bringing a, a paper to council or, or going to the community. So, yep, some, some learnings there. Um, but yeah, if, if you are referencing the historic material um, that we called options one, two, and three, um, they don't directly reference the, the options one and two that we'll discuss today. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that we do need to park some of the thinking that we've had in the past few weeks around the Three Waters Reform um, the identification of the $340 million that was put to the NTU back in October, um, that we have identified there's some funding challenges in that space um, for Council. So the options that we are considering around the table are very much linked to the existing LTP um, that was adopted uh, for 21-41, and the amendment is really a refresh of that um, with some up-to-date information. So a lot of what's been identified through that review process for Three Waters, but also for LTP amendment, is that there's a significant amount of investment required in the next four years uh, from from 24, 25. So really looking at moving forward into a planning phase next year for sig significant projects around the Pods Road uh, Water Supply Reservoir, Levin Waste Treatment Plant and the Levin Water Treatment Plant. Um, we've also been faced with some significant cost escalation around fuel prices, um, doubling, almost tripling in that two-year period since adoption, uh, significant labour and material cost increases, uh, the growth that's continuing to happen and has happened in that period, and really signalling that there is a lot of uncertainty around estimates um, across LT pre projects that are, that are that are in the infancy, and we've got three of those on the cards. And just to explain a little bit more around the, that life cycle and the the way we've approached um, some of the estimates within the current LTP and how we're bringing those forward into the options. I'll, I'll give it a little bit of an example around Pods Road Reservoir. So back in 2020, 21, uh, around the stage of adoption of the LTP, uh, it was really a, a concept project to say, we, we've got a need here to, to build a reservoir. Um, you know, there's a, there's a funding commitment, the land was purchased, there were a number of assumptions around the potential for a quarry site to, to, to gather up revenue, um, potential land sales. So as we move forward into this year, the calendar year, there's a whole lot more work being done to actually test that concept, 
to a point where it, um, you know, in terms of feasibility, but to a point where we could actually logic and send. So I won't, I won't run through the list, but it's really just to point out almost uh, an opening up that at a, at a project that sits at this level, but over time, as you start to know more information, it does really open up a big risk profile of, of a high end and a low end estimate. And it won't really be until the later part of next year when we head into that consenting process, um, late 23 into 24, that we could really start to, to develop up a concept um, design that could be put out to uh, out to a contractor. And a lot of the cost implications of that will be tied up with the, the requirements that come out of a consent process, um, but also around the, the ongoing development um, with our EWI partners in our community around the ultimate needs for that project. So there's a there's a whole lot more ground to cover, and the list there that sits on the right-hand side um, is by no means extensive in terms of what's been looked at this year, but that will be a growing list uh, that will have costs associated. So, we've, you know, there's, a, there's an approach we've taken with Three Waters to be uh, fairly conservative, to say, yes, we think it's, you know, it could be significant costs. Um, how we approach that with council <clears throat> and into the options that we're presenting today is option one. Is, a, is really more of a low end estimate. So we're saying, well, as we get more information in the future and we can assign a true cost to that, um, we can disclose that, and that may drive some trade off conversations around the council table as we, you know, into the next LTP as we start to think, you know, of project costs that are that are escalating over time. That there may need to be others that need to be bumped off the list. So that's a that's a continual process around that LTP cycle that we'll have to work through. <coughs> So in terms of framing the conversation with the community for Three Waters, we've termed almost the status quo as being not feasible. So to, to simply go out to say we can deliver exactly what's in the long-term plan for that price, uh, same level of service, same projects, um, really wasn't a practical option given that uh, you know we've seen concrete pipes double in, in prices in that period. Um, you know the, the fuel costs increases, just the, the project costs alone. Uh, but we've also had some emerging issues and aspirations around the likes of stormwater improvements. So really committing some additional funding into into improving some of the stormwater challenges that were faced over the winter period. Um, but also the prospect of, of managing our water network with the likes of water metering. So we've had some subsequent discussions in the last couple of weeks. So we've turned that option status quo plus. There, there is a $70 million dollar you know, additional funding requirement to, to deliver on that option over and above what's in the current LTP. It certainly doesn't go to the extent of the Three Waters transition funding, which was in the order of 110 to $140 million of additional funding. But what we're, what we're signaling there is that we could deliver pretty well what's in the current LTP with the addition of some stormwater improvements and fast-tracking those projects that were pushed out two years ago, the Pods Roads and the, and the wastewater plants, um, and, and, and really manage the, the balance sheet on that by deferring some of the water investments if we were to put metres in place to conserve that natural uh, resource. So there's a there's a general level of comfort uh, from, from officers that uh, this option with that additional funding um, would be achievable. And, and we've got some slides and we've shared some information around specific projects and whether we want to jump into that towards the the back end of this presentation or it's a subsequent conversation uh, but we were being quite intentional not to relitigate a, a, a full review of the LTP um, or, you know, on a line by line by project with our community given that it is an LTP amendment and we're, we've effectively taken the LTP as it stood and we've updated it um, with that new information that, that we currently hold. So in terms of the drivers between LTP 2141 and what we're terming now as option one. The big movers are, are set out here, so the, the couple of wastewater projects up here, followed by the water <coughs> projects and also the uh, stormwater in the bottom here. And so the, the first column here is the variance from the LTP and the second column being the, the total cost for that project. I uh, just would like to draw attention to the Pode's Road that historically that was part funded through Waters and part funded uh, as part of a property project um, with, an, with a revenue expectation around uh, the revenue from the quarrying activity. So we'll unpack a little bit more of that as we progress through. But um, 
indications as of today is that you know, the, the revenue probably wouldn't be quite where we expected from that quarry operation. Um, the staging and delivery of the of the plant um, in, the, in the, the actual reservoir itself would likely require a lot of that fill. So it's not to say there's not good material there, but the yields um, may not be quite what they expected. So it's just signalling and that will be picked up in some of the revenue assumptions uh, when we present that information. So is it worth pausing there for a discussion around what option one looks like? Is there, is there any questions? <clears throat> option two is what we're effectively terming meet the budget. So that's to say if the financial commitment to our Three Waters program stays exactly as it was in the long-term plan, so it's effectively a zero increase, what do we have to slice and push off? What risk are we carrying across that program? So that's effectively no additional investment in the Three Waters CapEx. Um, quite contrary to the message that we've been sending into you, that there's, a, there's an additional $100 million plus required over the next 10 years. Uh, it would require some short-term reduction um, in, in a number of areas, particularly around our renewals. And it would start to carry that risk um, of slowdown and in investment in the water space. So it would be mandatory metering. We would push out a lot of the um, the likes of a of a new treated water supply, or um, or or even the fact around the Pose Road. We could push that out further into the program, uh, but it does start to, to introduce the, the issues around the 24 hours of water supply and some of the community expectations around around level of service. Uh, it also means that we wouldn't be looking to put an additional $1 million per annum into the stormwater space. So it would be just running with the status quo, which is a, which has limited availability for significant improvements. And, and we'd need to really look at ad hoc type investment um, you know, on a, on a needs basis for, for stormwater work. And the other one is that in order to meet that zero budget, we'd, we'd have to give serious consideration to the likes of the Waitariri and Ohio water and wastewater projects. Um, and in particular around the staging of those that would need to look to ensure that we had a secure resilient supply um, of pipe water coming into the system, wastewater treatment out the other end, before we'd look to um, drastically expand our, our council network. So that's that's effectively the, the overview of option two. What we've been doing some thinking on is to try and understand how we could communicate this out uh, to the public. And in terms of the, the options that, that are on the table, the, the one around the NTU, there was an intention to not go to the community with that because we've already identified through this process that it's simply unaffordable. And, it, and Jacinta might be helpful for you to speak a little bit more about that in some of your slides. Uh, so that's the current forecast. Um, the Blue Skies thinking that was requested from NTU to say, what, what should we be doing now? To create that um, safe, resilient supply, um, no no constraints around funding. Uh, let's 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 get on with a three hundred forty two million dollar package. That's the, the message that's been passed on to NTU. Uh, but when we start to look at what's actually affordable, that's these two emerging options around a, a further seventy million dollars. Um, so that's two seventy five total. Uh, we would be pushing forward with the live-in wastewater treatment plant upgrade. So in a similar vein to the consenting process around Pose Road, that at, a, at an officer level, the recommendation is, it is really a non-negotiable. You know, I know we've had conversations at the previous long-term plan and there was some buffering and, and pushing out uh, towards sort of the 27, 28 period. But the message around the table today is that we need to get on with this. We've seen that growth in the last two years. Um, some of the issues that we're facing operationally at the plant, uh, we, we can't keep deferring that work. Uh, the other one is around the improvement of drinking water supply, so the resilience. Um, both options can still include uh, that Pods Road Reservoir project moving forward into consenting uh, next year, and then you know, program of work uh, to hand over to the NTU for post 20, uh, 1 July 24. Uh, we'd be looking at the water metering, and so that is really a key requirement that if we are to defer the live in water treatment. Uh, upgrades towards the back end of 2028-29, uh, 20, uh, that there would, there would be a requirement to get those meters in place uh, over the next 12, 18 months to ensure that we start to identify those leaks in the in the council um, or in the private landowner network. So 
that's the links that are on the other side of the fence. We've got a, a really good um, leak management system within Council Road Reserve, but you know, clearly identified that there is a number of links within private property, and that metering would allow us to, to pick that up. Um, not as a revenue gathering exercise, but certainly in, the, in, in a way to identify that um, that additional water usage. The key difference between the options is that funding. So it's a it's a zero or a seventy million dollar range, and whether there was a you know, seeking a bit of direction last week, there was talk about option one point five or you know somewhere in the middle, and that's something we can certainly go away with. And, and even leading up to engagement, we can do a lot more work around that project list. Um, things that can push in and out and, and run through the, the model, but we are getting to that point where we do need to draw a line of sand for Jacinta and the team to get on and actually model something um, to produce an output around rates, calculations and the like. Uh, the other difference was that you know, the stormwater improvements um, under the Meet the Budget, there, there just wouldn't be that opportunity, and then the deferral of those um, expansion projects into growth areas and that would have run-on consequences um, for confidence and, and timing and, and the like in those areas. and you can't talk about it to your community. So we can talk about, because um, we're going to have to talk about three waters reform. Um, and so we can talk about three waters reform. We can talk about our work with the National Transition Unit. We can talk about this unconstrained financial position in terms of what it would mean for our assets. But by not having, when we're saying, by not having it as a formal consultation item would make sense given like I can tell you what will happen, the auditors will come in, they'll see it as a consultation item and they'll tag it because it will demonstrate that we breach our own debt limit. That's some of us. That's got uh, internet problems. Right. Um, yeah, can I just test this then? So both options one and two, include water meters. So we're almost, I don't want to say predetermining, but we're saying that that's, by including them in both options and not including a third option, we're essentially saying that that's a, 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 a given, like it's, it's a non-negotiable, right? We can separate out the specific water meter conversation and have that <coughs> as a... Um, so you, we kind of have our big conversations with the community, three waters, landfill, rates, and there'll be some particular, there are some things that can pop out of that that we can specifically test and you can make a separate decision on. Yeah, because three um, water metering will become a focal, a focal point, right? And so it's all about the messaging where, like I picked up on what you said around, it's not about generating revenue, so therefore presumably we can clearly signal that it's not, at least initially, going to be used by council as a tool to allocate and charge for water, potentially, that it's it's a mechanism to detect leaks. So ultimately they're leak detectors rather than uh, a metering, um, uh, you know, that, that, it's a fundamental shift in the way in which we're going to be charging and recovering costs associated with water supply. Because that's what I've understood you saying, is that it's prim primarily about leak detection. Is that...? Yeah, so 40% of our district is metered, uh, which aids with leak detection. However, use, you know, there's a there's a minimum or maximum usage, and people are invoiced for additional usage. So it's, you know, it is a matter of you know, management in the first instance for leak detection. Uh, but ultimately, the way that uh, that metering operates across our community currently is that um, high users are invoiced for that for that water. So it's yeah, it, there is an amnesty period um, around leaks. There's a there's an opportunity to to work with landowners when they're identified um, through a, through a big usage or a spike in their um, invoicing. That if they you know they can provide a plumber's certificate, there's a you know there's a you know there's a rebate on the the high usage, but it's, you know, ultimately if someone's using a lot of water through leaks or through and not fixing them or for, through general usage, 
that there is a there is an associated charge for that, um, albeit quite a small one. Sorry, yeah, yeah. The, um, Fox and Beaches meet it, aren't they? Um, and obviously those people with swimming pools, um, some trades, um, wet, wet, wet industries. Uh, so you're saying 40% is is it? And so you're proposing the other 60 um, and, and install these. And what does that look like? Are you doing, in terms of rolling it out, is it across a couple of years and is it, live in first and somewhere else and what can I just understand a little bit more? Yeah, so part of that conversation is around stormwater, is around water meters and although it's an assumption of both options, it's not necessarily a requirement to include in those so it, we do need to do some work to frame up that conversation in terms of how we how we have that conversation with our community and ultimately bring that back for a decision as part of the, the long term plan. Uh, so, Just to quickly mention, though, in terms of any new lots now have a water meter as part of the new lot, so it isn't so that it's a, they're being built up over time by the fact that when we're growing, we're adding one. Yeah, but the the, the other the issue is though that the sixty percent that don't have them are likely where we've got the biggest risk of leaks on private property. So it's the yeah you know, we've got a whole stack of new properties um, with, with brand new pipes. Um, then you've got sixty eight year old um, galvanized pipes that clearly. Would be problematic um, that as a community if we were to identify those leaks um, there would be benefit for all in terms of the required investment in our water infrastructure um, that you know we've got a, a bit of headroom at peak capacity of around 2,000 cubic meters a day two to three thousand uh, but we know as time goes on that will be chewed up and that also the fact that um, you know in periods of dry weather we're extracting water from the river um, when, when it could probably be better left there if we were to find the leaks in private property. So there's a there's a really general opportunity there around around the metering, but we need to hear from our community in that space. So a couple of questions around that um, metering. Um, Jacinta, you said um, currently the income is one one half million, something like one point four whatever it was. Um, have we done any modelling around if you're universal district wide metering what that income would look like and what the um, the savings in water in terms of leakages and stuff would look like. One question. The second one was, um, oh, it's got out of my head. But the, the other one's the other one's a bit more a comment. Um, so someone who pays water meters um, for water meters is, is metered. Oh, I know. The question was too. Um, someone who, who um, uh, is water metered, you do absolutely um, take a bit more care about use of water. You fill up the summer swimming pool, um, you get a good bill, and that's fair. Um, you've got six people living in your house and uh, using lots and lots of water compared to Mrs. M or Mavis across the road who's there on her own. Um, that's fair. Um, and the third, so the other question was um, in terms of the new houses that the meters being put on, are they being read or are they just there for a, a later day? Are they currently being read and they're under the same, a less, less target rate on their rate, but pay for the excess water? Is, is that happening now? Yeah, that's right. So for they are being charged based on any, uh, I can never remember the exact one for Fox and Beach, Fox and Fox and Beach, but 91 cubic metres per quarter is the allowance for, for the rest of the district. In terms of metering and the decision around capital investment, I can speak from a, bit, a little bit of experience in terms of coming from Kapiti where I started just before they um, impl implemented water meters. It was a big political decision and there were a lot of angry people at the time. But it was also, there was a lot of emotion in it that once you understood the impact of putting meters in, they were facing, if we look at our borrowings and you were to look at Kapiti's borrowings probably eight years ago, we were in a very similar position in terms of the need for significant investment in water. And what that, what doing watering, what water metering did was that it, when it came to the implementation, I think their water use dropped by a roughly 34%. And that wasn't around people dropping their water use. It, there was some of that, but it was really around leak detection. And it, it went a massive way for them not needing to put investment into a dam and other massive capital, capital investment that they would have otherwise had to do 
if that understanding of where the leaks were hadn't been done. The question around who pays, that'll be a question that this council with the new entities will face anyway. And really the decision that's made around that pricing structure will be made for us um, for the future. So it's really about, um, and that, I mean, there's lots of different ways that it can be done around the level of fixed charges and the level of variable charges, which is kind of what we do here for our meters. So there's lots of policy decisions in that space, but the key driver for it coming in here is around making sure that that capital investment that we need to make is minimized. Yes, so, so following up from that, if, if this panel made that decision um, to um, adopt the universal water matter, um, would that is that likely to be, or would it be picked up through the three waters when, when that when it transfers over? Would they definitely do that? Or would they do that say, well, what I'm saying is that there could be a political impact uh, to, to the, this table and in doing that. Um, and is that something we we, we do, although I think personally I think we should, is there a risk of that being overturned by the, the, the entity C and saying, no, we're not going to do that? So the message we're getting is probably the opposite, that you know, that maybe at an entity level uh, that would be rolled out for consistency across the entity. Uh, today and the LTP conversation is about having that open, transparent conversation around the importance of looking after a precious resource and part of the opportunity to address that is through the meter and water, the leak detection process. Ultimately, this would need to come back to elected members once we've heard from our community for a decision, and that would trigger almost a business case to, to put, you know, it would become, a, it's not currently a project in the LTP, so that would um, allow us to move forward, get the numbers around it, whether that's 18 to 23% that we're, we're expecting it, it may um, provide in terms of savings. Uh, and then we'd come back with a couple of options around how that could be rolled out. Um, so we could, you know, do the by a series of meters and simply move them around the district. You could have the next option up of, of some manual meters, which we've got on 40% of the community. R rough water costs around about a million dollars to roll that out. Um, or you could go the, you know, to the other end of the spectrum with um, auto reading meters that simply um, remove that manual reading requirement. Um, and that was the higher end estimate of six million dollars. Um, but would provide a lot of op operational um, savings over time. So that would be brought back as a, 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 as a business case, um, but could be moved on probably within four to six weeks of, of any decision on that project. So it could be turned around quite quickly and implemented if that was um, the ultimate decision. Um, yeah, Ross, I, I think we're going to be forced a bit like fluoridation. Um, I don't think we'll have a choice. Um, I think it'll be part and parcel of um, what we need to do. And so we're being proactive, I reckon, by at least informing our community or giving them the option um, to say what they think about the whole thing. Um, I've always been a fan of actually being a little provocative in um, consultation. Um, we need to get their response from them. So if you put the stuff there, just tick a box or... Um, don't say anything, then it doesn't really tell you a hell of a lot. So you've got to be a bit sort of bolshy almost in terms of putting something out there that they are either going to like or not like. And it doesn't mean to say that we're going to necessarily follow what they say, but what we didn't do with the Fox and Paul a couple of years ago, for instance. But, um, you know, we do need to um, put that in, something like that. Um, my question, though, Daniel, was around your statement around the investment in stormwater improvements, small or zero increase, so that still maintains the million dollar investment that we were intending to do. Yes, yeah, so there's around $6.2 million over the next 17 years um, in the LTP, so you divide that up per year, um, it's, it's, it's about a half a project per year um, on a small scale project. So the intention was to add an additional million dollars per year is what would signal into the the NTA on top of the current. Um, and so what, what it's done is it's totaled up to $18 million under that current option. So there's obviously, you know, before final adoption that, you know, that could be moved around in terms of the final investment. Um, but certainly the option two scales it back to what's in the current LTP. So that's where we've termed it um, the status quo plus is that we have witnessed over the last two years the extent of issues in our community around stormwater um, historically, that 
you know, the, the limited investment in that space. So this option one that was put up was um, you know, signaling some additional investment in Storm Island. Yeah. But, sorry, Perry. Um, yeah, I don't know whether I'd be keen to cut that back, to be honest. I'd be keen to um, maintain that, I think, with the issues that we've had this year and are likely to face in the future. Um, I'd, I'd be keen to keep that. Yeah. Um, just around the leak detection, uh, we had, was it Albert and Paul here last week, and um, they saved two and a half million litres um, with the work that they did. Can you remind me, was that Levin's network or district-wide? And if it wasn't district-wide, where else could they go and sort that out to? Um, and then I know that the water meters is about more, more or less addressing the private um, water leaks, but what about us? Yeah, so there's been district wide a lot of work done in that space, um, and a few smaller tweaks in the background that we've been doing is around prioritising. Although, if you see on this list here, that totals close on 68 million uh, for those projects. There's some ups and downs in the rest of the program where we've tried to optimise uh, the likes of additional investment in Shannon, where that leak detection has identified a number of streets um, you know, that, that will be prone to future um, you know, f future pipe bursts and the like. So there's a you know, process over the next three or four years to really ramp up and get one street ticked off per year um, rather than kind of deferring that. So it's a, it's a, there's some ups and downs across that uh, capital program um, that do take account of some of that work that's been done. Perry, from my recollection, um, it was about a million litres in one place and it was over in the southwest part of town here. I, I wonder whether we could just maybe get a steer from the table, um, judging by the conversation around water meters. Um, I, I'd make an observation that there are, that there is something for you to think about as elected members is when we consult with the community on some pretty big stuff, that the water meter conversation could um, distract mm. that. And we can be okay with that so long as we're aware of that. And just judging by this conversation... Are you wanting the water meter conversation in the long-term plan or would you do not want it to be part of the long-term plan? Amendment, that is. I'm happy for water meters to be the only option presented in the plan. Just off the cuff, I'd say proper, just because there's, it will take a lot of attention away from probably the more like immediate concern like the landfill one those things we need to really focus on. But, look, I'm not afraid to have it, but I'm just saying that the attention might come away from what we're really trying to achieve. <laughs> Anyone else responds to that? Just to remind you that LTP prop is not an option because we won't be looking after water by then. Um, so it's LTP, it's long-term plan amendment, or it's wave goodbye, your hopes and dreams and aspirations around water meters um, to EGTC. So, yeah, so so I support them being included and uh, renamed leak detectors. <laughs> <laughs> leak busters, like ghost busters. <laughs> so I'm not not sure. Yeah, um, and I think, Mike, um, yeah, I think we've just got the answer, obviously. Um, but it's all about how it's wordsmith too, isn't it? And I think you've got some pretty good people in the organisation to do that. So I would certainly support it. Um, something we should look at a long time ago, in my view. Um, look, I, it's got, the conversation's going to be here at some stage, but I don't think we can avoid it, to be honest. Um, I am concerned, though, that it will deflect um, from some of the other issues. But um, and councillors will need to be really prepared for... Uh, probably even more days of submission hearings because we will have landfill and water meters to hear and listen to. So um, just be prepared because there will be a big response. But 
um, it may not be a bad thing that we deflect from the landfill either. Um, so, um, but yeah, look, it will mean a huge amount of work. But if, if I think we need that conversation. Can I just ask though, then, if we're saying that they are to be included in both options, so they're essentially a non-negotiable because there's no non-option, um, that there almost needs to be, well, the important thing for me is how they're actually used and what council is signalling around how these pieces of equipment will be used. And so if councils, if there's an option that says council's position is we'll look to install them as part of these options, um, but they will only be used for leak detection, not used as a, for, for allocating and charging fees in the short term, because there, there is no window for that anyway. That ultimately, these are going to be a tool that the entity C will be using, not council anyway. So, um, But if we're actually saying that, yes, it is... Um, um, the tool is ultimately around how we're going to charge for water, it's around allocation, um, it's around the charging, then for me it is a bigger conversation because I, don't, I didn't agree with Ross's statement about the difference between a, a one-bedroom, you know, a one single person, one-bedroom flat who gets a 1,000 litre a day allocation versus that five-bedroom house with, you know, seven members of a family um, getting the same allocation because that's that's what that's what we're saying is that we're setting it and by signalling this and saying we're going to use it for allocation and charging purposes, we have to have some information around how we're actually going to use it, how 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 the charging mechanism would would work. Through we wouldn't be ready in terms of going through a charging setup process for the next year. So we I, and anyone's happy to jump in, but from if we were to implement them all we would likely be looking at a charging process from the following year once they're all in because that there's quite a big, I mean, we could assume the same level, but not understanding the level, the volumes, all those types of assumptions are critical for us to understand to get the price right, to be able to make sure that we recover all the rates that we need to cover the cost of water. So it's very unlikely that there would be anything that would be able to be charged until the following financial year. Which is then not ours. Oh, yeah. Um, and can you install 60% of water meters before 2024 when they take over? Is that achievable? Yes, yeah, so the, the majority of our um, Tobies, if you open the little blue box out the front over the past 15 to 20 years, uh, we've installed manifolds um, that you simply unscrew the top and screw on a meter. So they are set up for that. Um, and it's oh yeah, so that, that we can come back with the uh, details in the business case. But the other the other thing to note is that this this is to help us manage that overarching investment in the water space so that we can signal in the seventy million dollar option that the priority is an investment in our wastewater plant. It's a priority in our, in our water resiliency because over the next five to 10 years, we're, we'll get a really um, you know, good control of our water wastage, um, which would allow us to push some of that, um, what looks like more immediate, immediate investment required in the, in the water space. So rather than treating more water, we find the leaks and then that allows us to defer some of that water investment, um, which, is part of, which is the reason why it's part of both options. But conscious, we need to go out to the community um, to have this conversation, and we also need to have some level of fairness and equity around charging. That um, there is a there is an existing bylaw and there's an existing mechanism in place for that. Um, so ultimately, that decision around timing would be a council one. Um, but you know we are we are already um, imposing that on a large portion of our community already with with meters. Um. I did have a point, but I think I've lost it. <laughs> no, actually, um, no, what I was thinking was, uh, um, and it was good questions around, you know, can you have that many meters installed within that period of time? But I was thinking, it doesn't have to be the whole lot at once. Can we not have isolation points? You know, but like electric fence on a farm pool, um, we don't have a, a cut-off switch at every gate. We have a cut-off switch at the end of each race. 
and I just sort of wonder, have we looked at options like that, um, you know, where we do isolate and target? Because we, we talk, I like what David said, around um, we're trying to capture water leakages, not charge you more for water. Yeah. The, the lowest cost option was purchasing around 50 k's worth of metres uh, and just simply leapfrogging them around the district. So the immediate focus was live-in, uh, but, you know, we could we can install um, quadrants across our district over a period of 12 months, um, leaving, leaving them in place for the you know, initial three-month period, pick up, pick up that reading, identify the leaks, work with the landowners, and then we leapfrog that onto the next uh, property in the next area of town. So there is a, there's a range of options from low cost, uh, but higher operational, um, because you've got to you know, go in there and unscrew and move around, versus the, the fully out uh, automated system, which is at the higher end. So there's a, there's a range of options that we can bring back, but we thought the most important thing was to have that early open engagement with our community um, around that prospect before any decisions or uh, options were brought back to council around implementation. So yeah, on your point, Justin, I think Albert's got flow meters that are at certain points throughout town, which tell us we're losing that much on the street. But the um, whose house on the street is losing that much is a pretty hard, laborious question to answer. Um, you get a thousand litres of water per day if you water meter. That's a, that's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. That's enough water for four people pretty comfortably. I don't see a problem. And yeah, if we're not going to build people for them, that's it. They're only going to be in for you. I'd like to build people for them. You know, if we if we make one point four million dollars extra, that'd really help. But yeah. So what I'm wondering, what I'm that option one and option two, we're making an assumption that includes water meters, and so we are looking for a steer on option one or option two to model into the rates. When we bring the report back in February around the draft, um, draft what's it called, long-term plan amendment in the consultation document, um, we will specifically seek direction from the table around whether water meters is in is, is formally consulted on or it's not um, because while like I'm sensing that there is some differing views and that's important but I just it, we don't really want that decision today um, that needs to be a debated decision around the council table but for the premise of forming the options we have put it in options one or two one and two because we see it as an important mechanism to help um defer the plant upgrades. Is that fair? Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. So going back to option one or option two, could we get a steer on what we should model? One. Option one, but I'd like to see the stormwater retained. No, yes, it does. Yeah, no. that's that's the pre-circulated material. Um, like I say, previously called option two, yep. option one being the three waters NTU, which we identified as being un unaffordable. So we've effectively brought those back for consultation purposes. And today's conversation is options one and two. So that, that's that one on screen that was pre-circulated with the additional stormwater. Yeah. In terms of getting a steer from the table over the two options, I'd be interested. This might fast track it. If anyone would like to argue the case for option two. No, not so much argue the case. I just wanted to kind of, um, talk about why water area, how water, waste water projects. I was under the understanding that the community have randomly rejected those in the past. And the consultation, is that did someone am I wrong on that? Well, they might have, but we've included them in the existing long-term plan. So to take them out of the current long-term plan, that's a that's kind of a specific level of service conversation with those communities. Probably just reminding the table that that work's not going to occur in the year one of our long-term plan amendment. 
and so it like it's in there but it kind of becomes a little bit null and void is that fair daniel yeah so it's sitting out around that 28 29 period so it doesn't have immediate impacts on on rates and borrowings and we under option one it could just be left there as part of a, you know, a future conversation leading up to that there'd need to be a lot more feasibility done around the actual the true cost for that so there are you know, some placeholder figures um knowing that there's a lot more work to, um, to do in, in a similar scale to the, the Pods Road Reservoir to, um, you know, to take it from an idea through to actual concept cost um, and delivery. So that, that could happen in the future. Um, but what we identified under option two is to meet a zero cost budget, something has to give in that program. Uh, pushing renewals, um, deferring further works uh, was you know, one of those items that was signalled um, that we would have to go back to the community to have a conversation with if, if there was some deviation from that. So option one doesn't require that at this point. Yeah, and I think I'm just conscious that we're not wanting to get into debate, but with option one and option two, we're not asking you to make the decision about water meters now, but um, water meters is kind of going to need to be a separate question we ask as part of consultation so that when you come to making your decision as part of the long-term plan, you can make a decision on option one and option two with or without water meters because it is a, it's like a subset question to option one and option two. But we probably need Carol and the team to do a bit of work on framing how that will look and how audit will look into that. So, and I, I listened to that and heard that, but don't, have, don't, don't both options one and two rely on water meters because... The whole program of works is premised on the basis that water meters is then um, meaning that you can push certain projects out, whereas option three doesn't include water meters in it, saying just go the full hold. But it's is that right? I can't remember if what option three did. The the NTU option ultimately that would be their decision. So that was why you know the the other bringing that into this conversation, um, and that's something we can go away and look at in terms of how we firstly frame up the conversation with the community, but also how we look at that $70 million additional investment if we were to remove the water metering, what, what that would mean on a per year basis um, for a financial model. So we could look at that if we were to draw the, to, to pull that water investment back in. So like really option one is the LTP as it currently stands with a few additional items around the stormwater the consideration of the water metering to try and buffer the investment that currently is you know two years ago we pushed that out in our long-term plan the conversation today is saying we need to pull that back but we can't afford to do that so in order to push it back out to where it currently sits in the LTP the option of water metering would enable us to do that um, but really eyes wide open around that 70 million is in 12 months' time, as we get more information around some of these large projects, we could be back having a similar um, affordability conversation. That you know We've gone with the low-end estimates on the basis that we don't have all the evidence to say you know, the costs are going to be higher than what's currently in the LTP, but you know, it is a fairly rough process that we've, we were here two years ago saying that this investment was required and a lot of it was pushed out um, for affordability reasons, uh, and we're back around the table having that conversation today. So it's... Yeah, it's, we, we can look at what that would mean if you know to exclude water metering or, or without. Um, but the the important thing will be giving a steer to our uh, our team who are um, out there developing that conversation material with the community, um, and, and can certainly put a you know articulate that um, in, in a manner that you know gets that community feedback in order for the members to make a decision. Sorry, one, one last question for me, Dan. Sorry. Um, the Levin and Wasteful Drip Plant Strategic Upgrade, um, how much of that is growth-driven? Um, how much is, it, is due to the high levels of compliance, etc.? Do we know what, what the drivers of that are and what it entails? It's a big ticket item plainly. Yeah, it's at the end of its lifespan, there's, there's been a number of... Uh, you know, evidence of breakdowns and, and, and risks that, um, you know, have raised their, raised issues in the last couple of years. It was 
it was on the radar two years ago and it was pushed out then. The message today is that we need to invest now and we need to plan for that because that there is a lead time around a, a development of a project of that scale um, to get firstly into you know even procurement whether it was design build there's a there's a whole lot of process um, and in order to move forward with that it needs to be sitting in a timeline with an LTP uh, which is the funding commitment next financial year to actually start that project planning so we're happy to bring the current you know information around you know what is a, a really old historic plant um, that needs to be upgraded for a the wider community of um, 8,000 odd ratepayers across the across Levin, knowing that when we do that upgrade, it would have a growth element to, to plan for the future because it's a it's a generation multi generational um, investment and and um, yeah facility that would be put in place. So. It would be um, um, built to, to cater for. Well, the higher levels of compliance are plainly, plainly uh, continue to be thrown at, at councils. Correct. Thank you. Option one. No. <laughs> so, sorry, the back to the deferral um, and not just about why it is but the um, the live-in one and the whole mechanism of water meters get, get, without having to flip back over to another document long-term plan and checking which year it currently sits and then where you're proposing to put it or no it's going to stay there could you just tell me because um, it's pages 517 pages that LTP so can you just tell me which which year it sits in? Yeah, can I come back to you with that information? Yeah, just a minute. So you want to know which year each one of those sits in, yeah. and then which year it could be pushed out to? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. So the next slides were to give you, based on the conversation that we've had, I guess just to highlight what that meant or means from a borrowing's perspective. So you've got the picture in your minds when you're um, giving a steer of what's comfortable. So in terms of the NTU option, so the green bars represent that higher option that effectively we're not going with at this stage. If we look to option, it says, op apologies, it says option two, but it's effectively option one. Um, in terms of that extra 70, um, we are still um, very close in terms of a, of a picture for the borrowings in year four of that LTP amendment. So what we'll do with the team between now and early January is look at the timing of the program and just understand whether there's any changes that can reasonably be made to the program in the first five years. Um, to possibly shift some of that timing given the criticality of some of the projects. So at this stage, given where the program where the projects are programmed, um, we're much closer to, to the LGFA borrowings limit than we'd like to be. And we're currently breaching our financial strategy limit. So we based on the steer that we've gotten today, what we'll do is look at the timing of those projects and look at whether there are any changes that can be made to the timing to better suit. Um, this program. Are we going to breach those limits anyway? <coughs> I mean, basically Daniel just said that he can't cost out for the next couple of years because there's going to be increasing costs and unexpected things he can't plan for. So if we're already at the stage where we're hitting that limit. Uh, okay. We are definitely in an unusual position from that perspective. Mm. Yeah. I think it's worth us looking at that timing anyway, um, assuming that it did stay with us so that we know that that picture is reasonable regardless of what happens. Um, so we'll do that work and come back once we've got that steer from you um, for those things. This picture's come up a few times, but from a excluding waters perspective for our borrowings, that's looking okay from a financial strategy position. 
there's still some good headroom in there for future decisions to be made around community facilities and other things for the district. Um, so that's just highlighting that at this stage. So the key one is around the impact of the, the decisions on water um, in terms of the overall borrowings picture. So I'm not going to go over this, the, the front picture in terms of what was driving the rates increase um, at this stage, but it would be good now to step back into the conversations around funding envelopes and where you've all gotten to. I think it's been a really great exercise to see you all go through the, the voting um, in terms of where you, where you sat in terms of the different opinions around what savings options would be good to consider. Um, so starting at 17.1%, what we have done um, within the calculator, that which I won't put it on the screen because I know that you've all got it um, within, within your PCs there, but what we've had a look at is where there were more than six yeses. So where more than, where a majority of you, um, if, and there have been a couple of changes in the last couple of hours, but nothing significant. So where more than six of you have, have suggested that you would like that saving to be made, so a majority, um, we've included that in the different options to be dis, to be considered. Um, so, we'll, we'll, so in terms of the staff recoveries, we talked about this, that's reasonable, um, the earthquake prone building, the options around fees. Now one I'll just mention here that actually wasn't or wasn't um, suggested or, or wasn't given a steer was the sports ground increase. So while it's small, um, this one will effectively come off that list because there were only a few votes from that perspective. Um, but otherwise, all of these ones, and I know the sports grounds doesn't actually make a significant change in terms of that overall picture. So taking those all into account, where more than six of you have suggested that you're comfortable with those savings, that leaves us at a 15.1% rates increase. So we've come down 2% from 17.1. If we then look at the options to what we'd look at in terms of calling financial levers, so those are the ones where we can make a decision around the funding between rates and debt. So in our water space, we had roughly two and a half million dollars um, of additional costs in that water activity. Um, there was a fairly, in terms of the decision around that one, um, 13 unanimous um, in terms of um, a, a preference for taking that forward as a savings option. Again, in terms of the um, potentially the assumption around the 185 thousand around the potential to save the assumption around what can reasonably be done in that capital program in year one, changing that from 47 to 37. We'll come back to you as part of that picture we talked about in terms of the timing of the capital program and make sure that that's achievable. Um, but that's not an unreasonable assumption at this stage. That gets us down a little bit further. And then the conversation around the unfunded depreciation. So that was planned to reduce as part of the financial strategy down from 1.2, um, down by 1.2. So this proposes that that um, come back a ways by a third. So effectively that would reduce the rates by 0.9%. Um, that one as well was a unanimous um, steer as well from that perspective. So that gets us to eight and a half. It's probably worth um, at this point acknowledging if you go back to option two, Jacinta, that um, I know there were a couple of additional kind of options in that financial levers around depreciation. Um, as officers, we're not recommending that you use any further financial levers um, other than what's up there. So, for example, um, the idea of removing depreciation or depreciation funding altogether or um, you're seeing we've put it in re reducing it by a third we think anything more than that um, we a it doesn't equal financial prudence but we think that there is risk there around both the national transition unit and oig I think we'll already get some push, but we can at least argue that we are still um, moving towards closing the gap um, with that depreciation funding. In 
terms of level of service cuts, I'll just check whether there have been any new ones added. Um, yes, yeah, so there was. So in terms of the um, the events having no contestable fund for events for 23-24, that $80,000 was recommended. There were nine um, that um, expressed a preference for that. And also the savings target of 400000 um, there were eight um, that expressed a preference for that. So um, what I'll do is I'll quickly step through now all of the different options. Um, also, here we are in terms of the additional um, savings target. We thought that, that by the time everybody had voted that that potentially would come through. So that gets us down to 7.4. These ones were suggestions. Uh, let me just quickly look at whether... It looks like at this stage around the blueprint, actually, Burn Mowing has just made it to the list. So this is a new one, actually. Let's, if we look at it, there are seven um, that have expressed a preference for that now in terms of, of stopping Burn Mowing entirely. So it's probably... Um, just worth stopping at this stage. Um, I don't know whether Brent, whether you wanted to mention anything or whether there's any f further conversation that was worth having around this one. I think the information that Brent sent out yesterday probably gave you a good sense of how wide the impact would be. So, so I think what we were, because I'm conscious that um, like there's the yes no votes, but what we've tried to do is on, on kind of on balance when we pull it all up and try and put it into some options. If we go back to option two, we kind of got here and could, based on what you all inputted, everyone largely agreed to this. So we kind of got to 8.5 quite easily. Then when we get to option three, option three um like that that was a fairly easy then when we got to option four that was a um there was a little bit more kind of when i say contention is probably not the right word but very various views so we kind of get to this point and it's there's a bit more mixed views around the table and i'm conscious not to get into debate <laughs> about particular things but what, what we are kind of trying to get out of today is everyone's had a bit of a go and we're at a point where we kind of need a number because without a number, we can't go model the rest of it and you'll hear a little bit more about that soon from Jacinta. And so what we're looking for a steer on is, well, you can see that you can get to seven point, if you go up to option three, Jacinta, you can get to 8.3 with... Um, pretty much no impact on levels of service because while that says level of service cut, what we know is that the three waters reform better off funding is actually going to provide some of that money for us. So you can get to 8.3 with no levels of service cut and then we could, you could get down to 7.4 by putting an internal savings target. And I think on Monday I articulated in a pretty frank way to you what the impact of that might be. Um, and, if 7.4 is not low enough, then you can keep going. But the further we go down, the more contention there is around the table. Yeah, and this this isn't a debate or a decision. This is this is a, just a step in the process, which puts out a preferred option for consultation, and it will be up to the people to tell us put that back or take that away. So, and then we make a decision. So this is not the end, even if. That looks like that right now. In terms of the four hundred million, for a moment, not debate. Can you can you um, cover that again? What that means? It's easy to say, but to, to, to buy it and think, put not point eight percent off the rate. But what is the reality to that? So I think um, uh, on Monday I articulated to councillors who came to the workshop about um, that internal sa savings target 
would require me to rethink the way our organisation was shaped. Um, and it would mean I would need to look hard at our labour cost. And probably one more in terms of the... I know it's stopping burn, burn mowing. Brent, can you, can you outline what burn mowing is? Is it mowing in front of people's private properties or is it um, the side of the street outside a... A, uh, a reserve or something. I know the main, we're always going to mow reserves, but is the berm along outside our reserves and things as well? Where there's no one in a house for the own mower to come out and mow it. Uh, yes, so the berm mowing is in front of the urban residential area, um, in front of the properties um, between the street and the fence, essentially. Okay, and one further, sorry, further to that. Um, that council owns? Yes, correct, that council owns. Can I just check then when you say entirely where it's urban one? Because I know your email said there's rural ones, but that comes under roading and is separate. So we're not touching that, right? Okay, good. Okay, so in terms of the options, the ones probably, um, so there's the berm mowing and then there is also the blueprint, $50,000 towards reducing the blueprint. Those are the two. Um, that's the extra one that popped on um, in terms of the voting, um, in terms of preference. So the blueprint one, there was a seven, um, seven votes in terms of, or seven yeses in terms of that being a preference as well to include um, in the calculation of what the rates would be. So including... The berm and the blueprint that would get us to a 7.1 or 7.08 um, rates increase to go forward. What that will enable us to do, if that's the preference of the table, is to go and put those individual changes um, through the model and make sure that then we can, when we come out on in early January, you'll be able to see property by property what does that mean um, and get a better understanding of the impacts of these individual decisions on the individual rates. Can I just add that? I want to make a note that if your average hour increases, they come out about 6.6. .6. So, you know, average as a group shows that we probably want to be a little bit lower. But that's because Councillor Allen has a... Oh, no, he's up <laughs> No, he's up to... <laughs> 6.9, so yeah, we're probably around 7 then, aren't we? Yeah. So that's probably a fair number. God, people are tutoring around for the last one. I'm lucky I can't get into it at the moment, so I can't make any changes. <laughs> um, I, I just wonder whether there is scope for us to go back to option 4 and potentially agree that that may be our baseline before we touch services and then if we go through to option five look at it from the perspective that that's five hundred and six hundred and twenty thousand dollars we need to find from somewhere because i think within some of the options that we've provided four hundred thousand to not give away to community groups i wouldn't feel comfortable with but if we shaded that back a little bit by a hundred thousand from there and then said to Monique actually finding a hundred thousand dollars does that work for you and then making a decision on booms to say we'll stop that that's another hundred thousand we might find what we want there to prioritize where that money's going to come from because it's just a pool of money six hundred and twenty thousand dollars that makes that percentage rate shift. I don't think one item is potentially going to shift that. And I think it will allow us to prioritise it by take on David's um, view and, and Bernie's hesitancy to look at that budget, um, the blueprint funding being removed. We might be able to manoeuvre things that way. Uh, do you, did you want to say something about Oh, okay. Um, so before I ask my next question, 
Clara, if Clint, did you say that second one there, internal savings, was the grants? Or are you talking about something else, community grants? Yeah, it's probably the option for the same kind of grants. Oh, so you're not pointing at that one being grants? No. No, no. So, it's at that one. Oh, yeah. Shifting. Okay. Oh, okay. So Do you want to? I can ask my question after you give the response if you need to. That's an option, um, but that option will have impact, right? So, you know, removing money, let's say 100k of our community development funding, that's 100k less available to community organisations. And as councillors, you might be okay with that, and as a result of that, that means that the savings target becomes a 300k savings target. Like the the impact's going to be, it's got to be somewhere. So you've just got to decide where you want that impact to be. Uh, so the question was, oh, is there another slide up, another option up there? No, that's it. Um, so it, last night I added three more and I'm not even sure that they're a possibility. Um, but those who have given their yes or no, there are some fours and fives out of fives, if you know what I mean. So um, there might be an appetite, but again, they might be a waste of time because they're not possible i.e. Um, increasing like a licensing fees, um, increasing nuisance and noise fines, if any, you know, like, so unless they can be confirmed as a real thing by officers, then it's no point in voting <laughs> or, you know, indication. Brent or Vi, did you want to comment on those ones? Maybe we can leave them for a minute because Vi's going to come up and chat about fees and charges in terms of her areas anyway in a minute. So we could we could touch on, the, on them at that stage if that works. So are, we, are we at the point that you're actually wanting us to hear on? On the option? Yeah, yeah, okay, cause I'll give yep, definitely, because uh, ultimately what we need to do is yep. plug yeah. all these options into the model and try and get a, a good, a really yeah. good, robust set of data for you for the sure. new year. Yep. So, so long the long. options are around probably the 7.4, where we are now, or going down to the 7.08. The difference between those two is um, the decision around the burn mowing and the blueprint. Yeah. So those are the two that we either include in the option or we... So the the, the, um, the burn mowing is not actually on there at this stage because it just was a late a late entry. Um, so this is effectively, these two are in the other 7.4 option. This one is one that we're talking about with the addition of the $50,000 option around the blueprint. So those are the key differences between what so, well, yeah, so I'm going to go the other way uh, for me because um, I, you know, I've said it on Monday to those who were here and I've said it previously that I have no appetite for levels of service cuts and struggle to see any justification for it. Um, I like option three and I'll add a little bit to that, I might, because the next already said that there's uh, other funding that can replace that without dropping um, the, the benefits of, of that fund to someone and she, she can find some funding for that. So we said we said we're there for six or eight point three. And then following on from Councillor Grimstone's comments around the message to the organisation to further go away um, and see how we can trim that. Um, but um, to, to go from eight point three now to, down to seven point four, um, and, and that involves uh, well further seven point one involves burn mowing. Um, but I'm not sure that those around the table fully understand the implications of that because I think some of us have been around in a while do. Um, and your phones will be going and you'll see things that you think that's not right. Um, and the other one, the, the, the 400 
uh, the, the internal savings target, the chief executive has already stressed twice this week the consequences of that at a time where this organisation is under unprecedented pressure to deliver. Um, all the reforms, all the work, everything that's going on, um, and we, uh, for some reason, are looking at um, reducing um, capability and capacity to, to do that. So, um, so my view, um, a responsible governance would be option three, um, with a message to the organisation to um, trim that. We can, we can that go in terms of some of the savings that um, I'm sure can be identified as well. So, um, happy to put that on the table, and, and we'll go from there. Um, I agree with you, Ross, to a certain extent. Um, my option is 3.5, sorry, um, um, because I'm, again, that makes it under 8%. I, I do believe that that is um, in line, a lot more in line with um, cost of living increases and um, inflation. Um, and then, so my target would be 7.8 and cutting the internal savings target by, by half. Uh, because I think that could be possibly achieved without having to make some significant changes to the operation. I think you could possibly, you know, with a bit of tweaking here and there, um, make that a, a, a bit more achievable. So, um, again, um, in terms of going to the public and being a bit more provocative in terms of the, the amount that we need, and I can guarantee that we will be, at, if we're under 8%, We'll be one of the lowest councils in the country going out at a level like that. There are a lot of councils going out double digits and higher. So I think, um, you know, if we can keep it under that 8%, I think we're covering both um, the affordability issue and, and some of the other issues that we've got in-house as well. Be interested in the CE's comments about the cutting in half, but, but take your point. I, I, th I think from um, a community perspective, and I respect the fact that we're in a space where, um, well, we are where we are. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I, I, I think that the community does expect to see a little bit of slimming, and I think being able to... Um, so, indicate that we're prepared to go on a bit of a diet um, to feel some of the pain um, is a good message to go out to the community. So I, I think that it's, it's worthwhile still having some form of savings target on the organisation to be able to communicate that through to the community. Um, I'm comfortable for it to come down from 400 so I have added another option just next to it if you'd like to change your vote in that space. Um, if either of you, it is a, it's a lot easier in a way just to see individually where you all stand, if that's okay. Um, just in terms of if you're happy with the $400,000 savings target. <laughs> um, Clint, I, more than, Councillor Grimson, I'm more than happy to change yours for you if you'd like. Or happy to just... Line 51. So if, if you would like to change your savings target from 400 down to 200, um, ideally that would be great. Just into, like, one of the things that um, I'm just reflecting on is that some of my scoring was based on an assumption that we could, get out, we could push the limits on the depreciation. And I acknowledge and appreciate the advice provided around that. Um, could you, just for my purposes, uh, include an option which is the fifty percent slowdown? So rather than one third, and rather than the hundred percent reduction there, I had the eyes. I think I think we could uh, argue for a fifty percent uh, slowdown. I think um, that and that gives us about two hundred grand. Um, but there needs to be some then that are deleted, um, so because that's fiddling with some numbers in here at the moment. So line uh, 64 and probably line 65. So just to note, there is an option on line 48 
for you to do it by half if you'd like to. So you can just vote yes for that one if, if that if that's one you would like. Super. Great. Mm -hmm. Are you happy to delete those? Sixty line sixty four and sixty five. Because that will fill, that will materially impact your number. Sure. So from this perspective, once everybody's comfortable, comfortable, we'll just leave it a little bit longer. It might give us a steer then in terms of whether it's seven point four or whether it's a little bit below in terms of the overall steer that we're getting from a majority. Is that if that's okay, Mayor Bruni? Yeah, I'd I'd be happy to leave some scope in that to go slightly higher at like seven point eight or eight and potentially add something good. I know we're all talking about cutting things, but like we we can do something good as well. That'd be cool. So my rough calculations are if you cut the savings target in half so that we could do something cool, um, maybe, um, and if you changed your depreciation funding from a third to half, that would get you to 78 percent Is that right, Jacinta? Yeah, it would. Yeah, because when add when add on point four and then take away point four, it would it would land us back at seven point four. We would be at seven point four still. Is everybody comfortable with where they sit on that 200k or 400k savings target? Just, just I'll pop my two cents in if that's okay. Going to half in terms of funding is really pushing it. We're um, creating, making a nice birthday cake with um, our future's money <laughs> in a way. Um, so I know it does, it, it is a nice picture. It's easy to, easy, it's an easy change to make, um, but it has long run consequences in terms of future generations being able to afford infrastructure because we're not asking those that are using it today to pay for it. I think I'll trust the CFO's opinion on that. <laughs> and all the infrastructure increases, but, but going to have kind of pushing it a bit far, I'd say, in my opinion. Just by cutting that service target by half, does put it back to 7.89, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with 7.8. Can I win another one? Just trying to work the maths. It will fit. It will sit somewhere between seven point five one and seven point eight. Is that okay? Remember, you're not voting. You're just staring. <laughs> well, within those, within those, 
Are you sure we can't chuck in some booms around the place, Councillor Brennan? No, so we're still, so for clarity, we're still mowing booms. <laughs> yes. So just to clarify, just to, cl to, to clarify on that one, we are not funding any increase in water spending. We're funding through debt. Um, we're assuming that we're reducing the capital program to 37 mil. We're slowing the debt funding by a third, but not by a half. Um, we are, the events funding, we're taking that out of rates because we're assuming that the, that the three waters, the better off funding will help us out in that space. Um, and they, then we are reducing the savings target um, down to 200. Um, burn mowing, are we saying at this stage that we are not? And what about the blueprint conversation at this stage? We're saying no to the. So seven point nine is what it sits um, in terms of a two hundred thousand dollar savings target. Not a fan of seven point nine. Neither. It's a when we consult with the community. So this is to so that we can plug a number in a system, and you know, we, we can see the impact. And you know, there might be a little bit that changes between now and you actually adopting your long term plan amendment. Picking up on the really important point, Pity, which is around democracy. Um, a council is keen to see, so a little bit like if you think about the options that Daniel presented before, where we have an option one and option two. If option one was 7.8 or 7.9, where we are saying this has a relatively nil effect on levels of service, here's our preferred option. However, we understand this cost of living impact. We understand that some of you think we need to go on a really big diet. And so here are some things we could do to save more money to get a lower, um, to, to get a reduced rates. Are you keen to consult with the community on some of those things around like reducing burn mowing? Um, additional um, like a, a, are you wanting to have that conversation with the community about levels of service so that they can f see, feel, touch the impact of when we want lower rates, it means we get less. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because I just had my booms mowed yesterday and I don't think that's fair. Uh -huh. It's six times in three months. I'm not kidding you. I live on Bartholomew Road. My burn's never been um, and yeah. neither half the people all about my area. So, uh, let have the conversation. It doesn't have to be part of the seven point nine. That's cool, but but put it out there. Um, so anyway, that that's cool. So, and um, we'll hear from Vi later. Okay, thanks. That was a good exercise. I think that. Thank you for that. I think that helps a lot. In terms of being I'm, able I'm to... just concerned that that conversation then becomes about the organisation cutting its cloth to suit rather than individual stuff. If you go, you are actually going to mention things like mowing booms and taking event money out and those sorts of things. Don't. Okay, mm -hmm. we're on. Yep. Yeah, no, my, my, my concern is that the, the community will just target the organisation because the biggest problem in the organisation is the wage bill, and they'll just target that. Yeah, the organisation Yeah, okay, right. Well, the organisation the phrase, then the community needs to... 
Yeah, just two, two cents with um, it's probably already been said, but I think at least giving the community the option to, to this is the consequence if you know if you want to if you want to reduce your cloth if, off your back if you like, mm -hmm. this is the consequence. I think it's a good a good way to at least and um, at least to have that conversation and communicate it, um, and then you know come back from there and actually say hey look well, this is this is what we heard and this is the result you know. So, so look on the boom thing, just again the two cents with. <laughs> And I don't want to spend long. I, I, I agree with Ross. We've been there. We've done that. The world has not changed. My worry about the booms are that we will we will hear the message potentially too late after it actually comes into into being. So there will be people who will say theoretically this makes sense. We are cutting our cloth and so on. But when the reality hits and the booms are not mowed across our urban district, then the organisation and the elected members will get the, what on God's name did you do? Why did you even ask? So I'm firmly against that. Speaking briefly to the blueprint, the blueprint to me, the worry is that that will sink without trace because as, as I think we noted when the blueprint was adopted, it's not sexy stuff out on the streets of our district. But the blueprint stands as the master action document for this for this council. It's about turning all those strategies and plans into an action, a series of actions. It matters as an organisation that we've finally adopted that beast, that we've said we want to actually have an action plan across those 12 activities. Housing sits at the top. These are key things. And I think for fifty thousand dollars in terms of the organisation spend or reduction, it's chicken feed. It's not going to it's not going to set the world on fire in terms of the consultation process one way or another. But it will be us owning and doing what we believe to be a good set of action statements. So I do put a plea out. I just need one more vote, and we're over the line. Listen to my plea. <laughs> So, Councillor Allen, that seven point something where we've landed, seven point eight ish, that doesn't, that keeps the blueprint funding in there. No, we've kept it in. But lovely debate. <laughs> um, well, well articulated. We're not making decisions, I, I just wanted to um, clarify what the CEO said earlier, that we are making, um, or we're increasing rates, we made some adjustments on the ability, on the amount that we're increasing by, but with no loss of service. And that the message that we're going out to the public with is that despite the rates increase, we could lower that even further with loss of service. Is that what you said earlier? So we're not actually going out there and saying we're increasing rates, but we're also losing a whole lot of services. We're going to be saying, just like you're struggling at home and you think that the butter's really expensive, we're struggling and there's a whole lot of stuff in our life that's a lot more expensive and so we're going to have to increase rates to cater for that. We know that no one likes paying rates um, and you might not think you get very good value for what, we currently do we could decrease rates we could decrease the increase decrease the increase we'll get we'll get less than a rate <laughs> not me we could decrease the increase but we would have to stop doing some things here's something here here here's some examples of what could, that could do that could be and how much we could save tell us what you think i think the um probably the important point is that 7.8, 7.9 is less than the 8.2 that you woke up to. Remember, we've woken up to an 8.2 that tells us that just interest rates, depreciation and insurance alone gets us to 8.2. So there's an important message in that as well. Okay, now we're going to move on to funding, revenue and financing policy. And I'll quickly step through some of the views that you have a bit of a reminder, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. 
Um, and just reminding you that at the time that we have set the fees and proposed some increases and some reductions to expenditure um, in the regulatory space, we made a decision that to make sure that we were within the target range of private funding, that we were going to increase revenue by 5% and reduce some expenditure in there. So that's already included uh, within the assumptions that we've just um, you've just given your steer on today. I'll invite Vi to um, the table now to talk through some of the conversation around the health licensing and dog and animal control area. Previously, these ones were split into different um, different um, buckets, um, but there's been some good analysis and work done um, to highlight to you some of the proposals around change and what fees look like in the space. So, welcome, Vi. Uh, um, so, historically, or well, the current policy is at the moment for health licensing, as we can see on the slide there, um, says that 25 to 35% of the cost to deliver that activity will be um, private. So that's by fees and charges. Um, and the balance of that is from the rates. Um, at the moment, we have been struggling over the last three years to actually achieve that. Um, and as we've done some analysis to look at where the costs are and, and how we might be able to generate some of the fees and charges, we've um, identified that it is unrealistic for us unless we look to increase the fees and charges significantly. Um, when I say significantly, we are looking, so in this space here, it's things like um, health licences, so hairdressers, funeral directors, campgrounds, food businesses. We are um, looking to, if we want to achieve the current policy, an increase of around about 150% for um, those particular businesses. And that's just, you know, we need to balance affordability for both us in delivering the service, but also um, of the public and those users um, and business owners. So rather than looking at... Um, that being the model is actually proposing that we change the policy for where we get the money from to deliver the service. Uh, we've got three people predominantly in this space, so not a huge amount of staff um, that we're needing to, um, you know, that, that we use for delivering this service. And we're, we're asking for a change there from currently 25 to 35% private benefit to 15 to 25% instead. And you can see that. Um, a bit there around what it looks like. Um, we've done some analysis over what other councils are charging as well um, and what their breakdown in terms of their revenue and financing policy says for um, this particular activity. You'll see at the top there our current 65 to 75% public and 25 to 35% private um, is relatively consistent with what other councils are um, currently have in their revenue and financing policy. It's not the most or the least either. Um, so the um, new proposal, 75 to 85 percent, does fit in line with um, some of the other councils that are there, albeit um, at the you know, more towards the 75 um, percent side of the scale. Um, if we're looking at fees and charges, again, um, with the exception of um, one council in particular that have pretty standard fees and charges throughout the um, majority of, of the businesses in this activity, we are quite in line with um, the likes of Manawatu and Tadarua, who are other rural um, councils, um, but we are charging a little bit less than some of the other um, metropolitan areas. So there is um, scope for us to increase the fees, um, but certainly not around that 150% mark. Cool. Um, moving on to the other area of mine um, is around dog control and animal control. So currently at the moment you'll see we're at 70 to 80% private benefit um, and we're proposing to move that to 55% to 65%. Now, part of the reason for that um, is we have had um, a change in some of the service that we now deliver in the animal control space, um, one extending the service delivery hours. So traditionally in the past, it has been uh, 7.30 till 4, 4 o'clock, Monday to Friday service, which just didn't fit the needs of our community. So we have extended that. With that has come a cost 
um, and we donate to obviously fund where um, where that um, change and, and service comes from. The other thing we also need to recognise in the um, dog and animal control space is that it's not just dog control, but majority of the income that we receive for this particular activity comes from dog owners. We are a rural council as well, and we do have stock control that we do need to deliver as well. So it's also recognising that some of the um, component um, in relation to the stock control activities that we do do actually doesn't it doesn't generate much income at all. Um, if we're lucky, we might get $1,000 in that space each year, which obviously doesn't come close um, to offsetting the cost. Um, and the other consideration here is around health and safety. So we do have, um, you know, we've, we've got quite a tricky job from time to time and, and quite a large district that we do need to cover um, and having one animal control officer looking at the after hours and, and delivering that service on their own um, has some health and safety considerations. So we have had to build that into the cost as well. I think it would probably be fair to say that with both the health costs health fees and the dog and animal control fees. So we're, we've seen, here's your current funding policy target. Here's a proposed funding policy target. That's coming from a perspective of how do we not increase the fees significantly in order to, um, like it, it's probably coming from the lens of that customer. It's not coming from the lens of the whole customer being the right part and so I do think it's important that you as elected members test us on that and you ask the question well ultimately do you think this should be funded should, should it weigh should, should the cost be more on the private um, person or should it be more on the public uh, because that, that's fundamentally the philosophical question that helps determine fees and charges so thanks, for, uh, thanks, mate. Because uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for putting that in because it leads into my question, and it's something I've brought up a number of times before. And uh, interestingly, that um, those been around the table before would know this is a subject that um, usually ends up in a long debate in council meetings when it comes to putting fees and charges up. So um, again, the question is why. Um, so in essence, dog owners subsidise um, to, to a great extent, obviously all the other animal control activities and, and response resources we, we have to put out there. Um, is there any energy going into how we can, um, in, in line with what Malik just said plainly, um, is there any examples around the region or around the country where there is an income from those other things other than dogs? Um, because you know, it's something I know I've, I've copped a number of times from people, especially when, when we put the dog control feeds up. But hold on, aren't we, aren't we paying for the animal control officers, not just the dog aspect, you know, which is true. So ultimately, for me, it should be certainly should be the, the cost of response uh, to issues should be um, borne by the person who owns the animals that we have to respond to, you know, for that, but that aspect of the charge. But I know that's not always easy. Um, is it? Again, is there any, any work going into that space? Should the, should the community pay through their rate? Um, a bit more to, well, potentially, because the community normally rings up and says, hey, there's still, you know, animals running around my backyard or whatever. So, um, yeah, sorry, it's a long question, but you know what I'm saying. Um, thanks, Councillor Brennigan. So, the, um, I, I guess you're right, that's the question, isn't it? Is that there is some of the animal control role um, that is stock control and the other is dog control and um, all of that is rolled up into um, the, these numbers here but the issue I guess we have is or the challenge we have is that to deliver the animal control service we still need the base staffing to be able to do that um, and there is the public safety element that goes with it right um, and so I guess that's the, the question today is around how much of this service is um, around preservation of public safety and, and there is that public component versus responding to dog control matters. Um, that said, I, I must say in, in terms of the work delivered by the animal control team, majority of it is around responding to dog control matters. Um, and the Dog Control Act is really clear around reco cost recovery as well. So we need to be reasonable in terms of what we charge dog owners to deliver that service. So. 
So, I guess the, the, the obvious question for that is, you know, the vast majority of dog owners in the district are responsible dog owners and their dogs don't cause anyone any problems. It's just the the, the, the minority that cause the cost that create the cost, I suppose. But so how how is it how is it best funded rather than year on year on year saying if you own a dog, no matter how good you are with your dog, you get a you get a subsidy, but we're gonna keep putting the fees up. And it's just, you know it's not an easy one I know, but I'm just saying is is your Sure. Just, um, just quickly to respond to that. So um, you'll see when you look through our fees and charges, not all of them are sitting um, on that comparison sheet there, but we've got a number of different categories um, of dog registration. For um, the fees, what we've done is um, the amount that we charge for an, an entire dog, for example, is more than what we charge for a, um, a D6 dog. And we've actually done some calculations around how many dogs in our database are entire. Let's how many of those um, dogs that we've impounded are entire charge the fees. Of, you know, look at the percentage of how many dogs that we've impounded are entire, and the same thing and set the fees to that. And the same thing around um, D6 dogs. So we did some work around rural dogs as well, but it gets quite tricky now because we've changed the fee structure a wee bit around just entire, just D6. So if I just um. So sort of following up from Councillor Brennigan about the, so what I really want to understand is, because I'm or, I just cards on the table, I'm already having an allergic reaction to the shift of more public rather than private, because for me, I'm a, the exacerbator should pay, or the person that's causing the need for this service should should pay. The, um, but the percentage of, it, of the totality of the activity in the animal Control dog and animal control that's being spent on stock or non dogs versus dogs. Like, do we have that kind of? Um, can we proportion it out that way? Because that's a really important number for me to actually understand whether the the comment that dog owners are subsidising um, that uh, non dog activity is actually a significant problem. Um, thanks, Councillor Jennings. Yes, I, I think we probably could um, get you know, that, work out what the percentage of it was. I certainly couldn't tell you that right now. I need to do some work on that, but I'm sure we could yeah, work out the costs. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, just want to say thanks for the table of comparison with our neighbours and you know, those within the dish, uh, wider region, um, because just looking at that, we're kind of middle of the road in a roundabout way we're not the highest and we're not the lowest um and you know i've, I've got a dog so not not a problem paying fees and to um councillor jennings point about um more of the private i mean and of course we've already agreed to five percent increase in these fees anyway so this conversation is after but yeah um i don't have a problem with yeah the yeah, if anything, I'd put the private end up. So just in terms of a steer for, from the table, in terms of assuming there was a 5% increase in fees, is there some comfort around the proposed change? and what? So that would mean... Um, a private going from 70 to 80 down to 55 to 65 um, at this stage in terms of the proposal? So I, I, I'm happy to start. Um, so my reaction to both this and the um, that is no, I'm not comfortable with it. And I'd be advocating for increases in the private rather than the public because uh, for me, particularly in the, the first one, the, the, it's a cost of doing business is cost of running a business to be licensed to meet the regulatory requirements and yes the general public um, will benefit from that but but if anything it should be almost like a 50 50 in that in the, in the case of that first first one because the customer ultimately pays through the whatever price they pay the business for that service um, so yeah so that's where I sit so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not on board with that but I'm keen to hear what that the table. 
look, in general terms, I am comfortable with it. The only um, concern I have is that normally there's a more robust process we go through. So there's a series, and my memory is quite rusty on it, but there's a series of questions about the who benefits, who's the exacerbator, what are the, the tumours and heritage, but what are the social benefits around the decision? So there's quite a, there's from memory about five or so questions which we ask when we go through this process, which makes for a more rounded discussion. So that, that's my concern. But I understand that the timing and the need to make a decision and on balance, I support that. So uh, it's important to note, it's a good point. Um, so this is a, to give an indication of more, some more information at this stage. But in early January, we can absolutely have that conversation in terms of the questions and step through that as part of um, one of the early workshops. Yeah. Yeah, for once I'd agree with Councillor Jennings on the public-private split that, that these charges should be more leaning on the private side than publicly funded. Sorry, if I can just make um, a, a quick comment, particularly around the health licensing ones. Just um, thinking about the other activities that are actually in here as well, so they don't actually have a fees and charges component. We're not able to, um, you know, cost cost recover some of that activity. And there's things like um, environmental health complaints, rodent complaints, um, rubbish nuisances, um, general nuisances, where there is no fee associated with that um, and potentially no infringement um, or any way for us to recover the costs either. Um, so I just wanted to add that into the mix um, around these. It's not what you see in that list of fees and charges is not accurate of the entire activity and what gets delivered from the health space. So pointing that out about the there's no fines for that and there's no this for that, is that because we can't do that? Um, oh, you're nodding, yes. The Health Act is from 1956. For a lot of those, <laughs> the infringements are like, I kid you not, $50.00. Um, for the infringement, the cost to go out there and do the enforcement costs well in excess of $50 um, to do that. Um, and so there is, I guess I just need to put it out there, that needs to be some recognition that some of the costs aren't actually for any of the people that are sitting or any of the businesses sitting in that fees and charges list. Mm. Okay, so it sounds like in the new year it would be good to have a conversation around those key questions and maybe a little bit more around what proportion of the activity is related to the various parts of the services which we can do to help with that decision making. Does anyone else have any other questions before we move on to? Oh, no. okay. just, just one more question. Um, what's an offence of trade? <laughs> There's a list of, of trades that are um, identified in a schedule in the Health Act um, around defensive trades and um, I'm not an environmental health officer, I couldn't rattle them off or, or trust my memory to do that, but they're listed for us. <laughs> okay, so now we are moving on to another light topic, which is rates review. Um, so Jeff's going to come and join us at the table. Um, so the purpose of today is to talk through where we've got to in terms of the rates review and give you some more um, information and um, points for discussion in terms of where we're heading. Um, to start things off though, what I wanted to just make sure everybody was clear on is the types of rates that we have and on which basis that they're, they're charged. So we have approximately $11 million that's charged um, in terms of the general rate. What that covers, um, so it's a big portion of our rates, um, that covers our regulatory services, so those portions that are not covered by um, fees and charges. That includes animal control, parking enforcement, and the general regulatory services that aren't covered by fees. In terms of community facilities and services, um, it covers those, but with the exclusion of libraries and community centres and the aquatic centres um, rates, which are a fixed charge. Um, in terms of, it covers community support, which is 
also includes emergency management and rural fire, community engagement, visit information and economic development, as well as um, governance and community leadership, some of the activities um, in terms of strategic planning and district plan. Um, there is a specific um, governance and general governance and community le leadership rate as well, and also treasury activities. So that general rate um, is a pretty broad one, and it's covered and charged as part of a land value, based on land value. So one of the options that we're going to talk about is, do we want to still continue for that to be charged based on land value? Or do we want to look at a different option for charging that? So one of the options that we've put together for you is around shifting that to capital value as an option. We've, we've also got our solid waste rate, um, and that covers all activities in the solid waste set area, including, for example, recycling. Um, Stormwater, which is charged based on capital value now, um, and that's charged to the towns, effectively. Um, there is some work that we um, could do in this space around chain. There are some benefits that some areas of the community, for example, some of the rural areas will get from our stormwater work, um, but typically at the moment that's charged on an urban town space. The library rate is charged to everyone in the district, and that's charged on a per use, per use um, separately used or inhabitable part, so back to, per unit, um, effectively, for the library rate. We've also got a separate one for representation and governance, which, which again is a fixed charge. Aquatic is also a fixed charge. Our roading rate is a capital value based rate. Water and in our water rates, there's a portion as we talked about before um, that is based on approximately one and a half million once you include GST um, is by meter, but the rest is um, based on a fixed charge per property. Um, and as well, the wastewater rate is a fixed charge. So with the exception of, our, of infrastructure or water-based rates, there's rules that are set by the Local Government Act in terms of what portion of our rates you can charge on a uniform annual, annual general charge basis. And there's a calculation that we have to complete with our auditors and as part of setting the rates. And they say that that should be no more than 30%. For us, well, I think we're at 29 point more than 29.5%. We are very high um, in terms of the level of fixed charges that we have. So some of the options, and what those, that does is that that means that regardless of the value of your house or the property that you have, you pay the same. Um, so for this district, that is pretty high. Um, for some councils, and this completely is a political decision and, and it can your views on it will change, can vary broadly. Um, depending on what your um, what your thoughts are, what your beliefs are in this space, um, it is of it has been just dis discussed um, in a number of circles that, from an equity perspective, um, some ways that you could consider making rates more equitable were around reducing the level of, level of fixed charges so that it would be more based on the value um, of the property that you own. Um, as well, there's some options around providing additional remissions based on affordability. Some councils do do that. But effectively, what that would mean is that you would be rating to make sure that you had a pool of funding available to distribute out to those that might not be able to afford it. Then there's also the last one, and Councillor Jennings mentioned this before, is making sure that significant exacerbators pay their share. Um, so that could be through making sure there's a good level of fees and charges. But also, on the other side, it's looking at rates for things like forestry and making sure, for example, in the roading area, um, that they're paying a higher proportion of the roading rate because they're, they're causing more deterioration of, of the roads. So for some, op we've, we've developed some options and we've also taken into account um, the what's happened with the with the revaluation and we'll talk about that a little bit more but in general we've looked at some options that we've modeled up around as i mentioned the general rate looking at shifting that to capital value and also looking at some different combinations of our fixed rates um, and potentially moving some of those to capital value so we've picked a few different scenarios for example the library and community center rate 
the library and the community center as well as the aquatic right um, and also the library and community center and the governance right. Another one that we're going to add and bring to you in the new year is around potentially shifting um, the governance rate, for example, into the general rate and charging that based on capital value. So it's about picking a few different options and allowing you to see what that does to ind individual pockets of property owners and seeing whether that achieves some of the outcomes that you might want to through through looking at rates. Just on to, can I just ask back on that slide? Um, I assume that you can't have for certain types of property a fixed value and then the rest on a general rate, can you? Because, like, take um, library and community centre rate and call it rate. Like, for some rural based properties, that's that's always an argument. Is like, so somebody living in Opiki or Tokamaru, yes, they have the ability to access those facilities, but they don't really use them because they're quite far away from them. So, could you potentially say, well, maybe it's appropriate there's a lower fixed rate for all of those properties but for the rest of what well, you know like and so whatever the geographical boundaries are that for the rest of the community it's on based on a general um cv rate or can you not you can't mix it up like that or it gets too complicated you can do pretty much most things um it's just about trying to keep it as trying to keep it as simple as possible. You don't want to make it too complicated. But for example, um, what you mentioned there around different, that's what effectively, in a different sense, but what a differential does for the general rate. For example, you're saying, we want to charge um, all of this, these services, we want to charge them through a general rate. So we're going to charge a per, per unit of land value to, be, to decide what, what that rate is or who's going to get what. But for rural properties, we also want to identify the fact that those properties have a significantly larger land value than do the standard property. So it's reasonable to assess that they pay us a lower portion of that. So, for example, in that space, if you were to move um, the library and community centre rate, for example, to capital value, you could decide, for example, that you wanted to have a, a rural differential on that. To recognise that type of thing, so you could, you absolutely could do that. So, so that would certainly pass. If those costs then went down to those those rate payers, it would pass that extra cost on to others. How would that affect for if, if we would that address affordability? No, It'd go the other way, wouldn't it? It depends, and this is the bit where it's good to see. And we haven't got all the analysis ready today, but this is the bit where it's really good to see at small pockets, because then you see, because it, it might, yes, it might affect the, the rural area, but there might also be pockets. And as the valuations change, for example, of significantly larger houses being built in the district, because there's more money coming into the district, bigger houses, which means more capital value. So if you're shifting to capital value, then you might be able to pick up some of that affordability through more shifting onto those um, based on a property value or a capital value basis rather than on a fixed charge or a land value basis. Yeah. You'll start to see a little bit of that as we as we move into... So I know QV went through this process with you, um, but I just wanted to highlight for you again um, in terms of the, the blue represents the capital value percentage change um, and the the orange is the land value percentage change. Um, so you can see residential had a significant um, capital value change. Land value as well, but not as much as did the capital value. In the industrial area, it was massive. Um, utilities quite big as well, residential, commercial not nearly as big, and then in the, in the rural area. In those sectors, it was a lot smaller. So what that what that means is, if we were to change nothing from a rating policy perspective, we would expect to see the burden of rate shift from rural into residential, and that's because the values haven't increased as much or at the same level as they have in the in the residential and commercial area. So in practice. Take the what was it, what, what, 
I mean, it was the 7.8 or 8.4 or whatever it was, the percent increase, which is after growth as well. So that, if we change no other settings in terms of the rating settings, that for some households, with these um, valuation increases, could actually look like a 15, 20% increase for them. It could, absolutely, yeah. And for, yeah, so for example, Foxton Township, um, Shannon, Tokumaru, you look at some of our areas that you think maybe would have those areas of the district that might struggle to pay more than others. Unfortunately, as well, they've also been hit with the biggest valuation increases. So um, from that perspective as well, that would have a, an increased um, impact. Uh, so this is just a quick view in terms of the rural and lifestyle properties, but highlighting again that where residential, for example, was close to 100%, um, in these areas it was quite a bit less. Even though it's significant, it, it was quite a bit less. So in terms of our overall rates of roughly um, 52 or $52 million, assuming that nothing else changed, and we didn't change anything in terms of policy, um, that valuation change means that $106,000 was shifting out of being paid by the rural sector into the residential sector. And actually, in terms of an understanding, it isn't actually as bad as you would have thought it would have been given what's changed. Um, that largely as well is due to the fact that we have a fixed... Um, a predominantly fixed charge based system. So it doesn't really matter as much for a significant portion of those rates what the valuation is because it doesn't that doesn't impact how they're charged. But for our roading rate, our stormwater rate and our general rate it would have. So that effectively means that there's one hundred and six thousand dollars moving between the two. Now I've got in terms of the presentation, there is a lot of graphs um, in there. Today, I'm not intending to go through them all with you because it, it probably is a little bit of overload. Um, but I wanted to have them all wanted to have them all in there for you, um, so that you've got some opportunity to um, have a look at them, digest them, and then we can talk about it in more detail again um, in the new year. So there are, in the residential space, um, while you've got some properties that are increasing, um, are increasing, a huge proportion, almost 2,500 properties, um, are actually reducing slightly between 0 and 5%. So there is a, a fair amount um, based just on the valuations um, that are reducing. But this also doesn't take into account... Um, the value of the rates that they pay either. But from this side, well, there's roughly roughly 2,500. There also are 500 properties that are increasing with, with no change in rates yet applied to that between 5 and 10%. There's probably 250 properties that are changing between 25 and 50%. So, yeah, it could be. Well, yep, it could be. Um, or, but we don't also, we actually don't have a lot of properties that are charged based, not a lot of charges other than roading and stormwater that's charged based on capital value. Um, so Shannon, you would expect some of those to sit in some of those areas that have increased significantly. Tararua Road as well um, is a big spike in terms of valuation increase. In terms of rural, um, just to give you an indication, there's a significant amount of properties that are planned to decrease between 0 and $25 or 25 to $50. So not significant, not significant amounts, but, but sizable enough. Um, there's also roughly close to 600 um, that are, <clears throat> and close to 600 that are planned to increase um, by 100 to 150 or 150 <coughs> to 200. And I was meant to print this and I got busy, so I, <laughs> I have to confess, I apologize, I haven't printed it for you. Um, 
it's on your portals so please don't try and read it on the screen but it's important I'll, I'll just describe it in general terms um, so that you've got a chance to to um, look at it um, in actually would you mind printing yeah. we might just go past the slide and then Jeff has kindly um, offered to print some for us because I think it is useful that we step through it but um, if you don't mind that'd be great Maybe 12. Just 12. Oh, that's great. Sure. So when we talked, Councillor Tokapur, I believe, asked, you will note, when we, when we release our annual plan documents um, or long-term plan documents, what we try and make sure we do are include some indicative properties um, so that people can get a sense of what's happening within the individual areas. So what you see is some different locations across the district, a sense of, and this utility one we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, it's generally around the median level of or the middle property for that different area. So for example, I'm going to pick... Um, I'm going to pick Levin to use as an example. So this is one that we've used um, quite a bit in terms of some of the explanations. Um, so previously a property in Levin worth $530,000 from a capital value perspective has a land value of 180. That They've now received a letter that says actually their property is now worth 750000 and it has a land value of 335000 So it's a significant increase um, in terms of value. They currently, in terms of their rates, pay $3,157. Based on the new valuation alone, they've actually dropped um, in value or dropped in terms of the total rates that they would pay. Um, and that's because that property, while it's increased significantly, hasn't increased at the same rate that other properties across the district have. Um, if we pick, is there a Shannon one on there? Oh, yep. A property in Shannon that was previously worth 235 from a capital value has gone up to 485. So where they were paying 2,730 are now, pay, now paying 2,951. So you can see for some areas of the district, there is some significant check. Foxton as well, roughly 300 and almost $300 that, that that property will pay extra in rates just from the valuation change alone. Um, this rural property um, was paying $7,800. Their bill's gone down by almost $600. So you can see there are some significant moves in terms of the impact that that valuation has across the district. So what we've done now in terms of this this next few boxes is to give you an idea of, and I'll pick this live-in property again. Okay, so let's assume that we've, we've done the valuation. We know that that's, if we were to go out, there would be some big changes. Let's assume that rates aren't going to change at all. What if we were to look at changing the general rate from land value to capital value? And that's a change that we made across the district. We're not changing rates at all. What would that mean for that same property? Well, for the Levin property, that would mean that rates would go up to 3,200. The reason why that would have go up more was probably because a property in Levin is proportionately worth more on a capital value perspective than would be another property across the district. Um, If you were to pick Shannon, that would probably, it would stay about the same um, in terms of its impact, that particular property in Shannon. What we'll do now is look at, okay, um, what are some other ways that we could move and, and look at different options and how that might impact is to look at changing some of the fixed charges um, and moving them to capital value. So if I pick the Shannon, for ex as an example, where it was going to go to twenty, where it was originally going to be twenty nine hundred, 
it was um, under this next option that was going to bring it down to 2800 2795 if there's a different option we decided not to do this one but we were to shift a portion of of the um, li move the library rate to capital value that would roughly do about the same thing for Shannon as would shifting the general rate to capital value so you could there's different ways that you can shift things around, but they're going to have different impacts on different sections of the property. So um, another thing that we're going to do, for this, this option down here looks at moving the library and the, rep library and the governance rate um, to capital value. You can see with all those different options, they've got a fairly similar impact um, in terms of the Shannon properties, in terms of Levin, they're also fairly similar. So there aren't significant changes, um, but what we'll do for you in the new year is give you, or we'll actually send it out as soon as we've got it in, in the first week of January, is at that SA1 and that SA2 level is give you that, what is that What is that area of the district? What are the median, what's the median rates um, given all the different options? What's the household income in that area and what would be the impact of changing rates um, for that individual grouping of houses um, and what's so that you can understand from an affordability perspective what that what that's going to do can, can I just emphasize that that rates modeling up there and those four options is based on today's dollars so that does not include the 7.9 percent potential rates increase Jacinta, can I, um, we went through this, last went through this um, exercise, I think, and it was first, my first term, probably I remember it, in 2013, um, 14, and it was around um, the move to capital, full capital value there, I think, and I think, the, Jeff, you'll remember, I think the compromise was uh, the, what we've got, what we're dealing with today, because there was quite significant impacts on certain areas in the community by going to full capital value that for some was unpalatable at the time. Um, looking at option one there, and I don't know if this, this is just the first look, um, that's changed, can't change a whole lot. And I guess that's because of the valuations of, 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 sort of yeah, across the district have risen. So there's not the anomalies now I think there was back then. Um, it seems a whole lot more reasonable and moderate in that first look. And yeah, But remember that one, that option one is just the general rate. So that, yeah, but absolutely. That, and it's kind of, I think, it's a massive step to go just to capital value. But for us to pick a few that are palatable, and maybe it's over a series of years, if that's preferable, but yeah, not to try and do it all in one go. But the, you're right, the key driver is the fact that there's been a significant shift in terms of the, the mix with evaluation, that to keep that proportionate share of who's paying what, around where everybody might be comfortable now would mean that you'd need to make some rating change. I was just um, wanted some clarity. So that potential 7.9 or 7.8 increase, is that equally distributed across all those? No. Um, and that was one of the real drivers for us to try and get real clarity about what those options were today so that we can, when you come back in the new year, you'll be able to see this with that 7.9 added because those individual rates or those individual impacts that you've decided on today will impact in different ways. Is there any way of assessing numbers and models to show the equity and distribution across them? Is there a way that you can rank them? It's probably need a statistician to do that, do we? <laughs> Sorry, do, do you mean in terms of... Oh, I'm just Yeah, have you got your shiny map that does the income um, income ratio? Yes, yeah, so we're not ready today, but we will in the first, so we will have the, for each area of the district. What was the rates as a percentage of household income currently? What's it with the valuation change, and what's it with um, option one, two, three, four? 
So that will that will go some way to help. We've also got just to I'll quickly flick to this one. Um, oh, Mm. Go ahead. Uh, there was a what was the utility one there? That's, can you explain it? Yeah, sure. So we are looking at that utility area and um, coming up with some different options as well. What Utilities is, is so, for example, that's the electro lines. That's our water infrastructure um, as us. well. It's, it's partially <laughs> us, but it's, but not all us. Jonathan, it will be entity C so. This is just one I thought might be interesting for you. This is roughly all of the properties in our district that receive a rates rebate. So this is the distribution across where they sit and the number of properties um, in those different areas. Also an indication of just based on um, where of those 153 properties, this is a, an average capital value, average land value that those, that that sit within those areas and just gives an indication of what their current rates look like and the different options that we're proposing. So everything in green in terms of the different options would be benefiting those properties. So those people that are already paying rates rebates, um, are they going to benefit from some of these different rates options that we're looking at? As you can see in the rural area, um, currently, based on those changes that we've made, that would hit those areas um, in terms of those that are receiving the rates rebate currently. So we need, we're trying to be careful with this group of people and make sure that we understand the impacts of what we're doing um, in this area as well. That's where when we talk about things like um, affordability options in terms of remissions, this gives us a good indication of where we might may want to target that because this would be all properties effectively that earn less than $40,000 and are able to apply for rates remission. This gives you an indication of the different changes that we're proposing and the impact um, that it has on these different areas of the, of the population. Just under why, um, you know, you say the green are the ones that benefit. So in that Levin line there, for instance, that's all less than the current rates. And so... Hokio Beach. That could be me, me being tired last it's, night and not colouring the green. <laughs> so they should be green, shouldn't they? Yeah. Thanks, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the Wednesday before Christmas. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Brenny. You're right. Um, yes, absolutely. So our aim would be that um, if we're trying to help out those members of the community that might struggle more, um, it's trying to see whether those, those options, having the that understanding of who they are in our database helps us. Thanks, yes. Where, where are we at with the uptake on the rebate scheme? Like those eligible and those actually applying for it? Oh, gosh, I can't remember the number. Monique, do you have it handy? We've done extremely well this year. Um, Peshan and the team and Diane have done a phenomenal job of increasing the level of people that have that have um, received their rates rebate. Um we haven't yet, in terms of those that are eligible versus those that apply, we are still actively um, negotiating with how, getting help from the OAG and working with the DIA to try and trust us enough to share their database in terms of who's eligible so that we can provide, easily provide everyone that's eligible with or facilitate that to happen, but we're not quite there yet. Um, uh, so, so from September 2021 to September 2022, we almost doubled our access and rate, rates rebate. So we went from 489k to 914k. Thank you. Sounds like we're about 100 houses ahead at this stage. One thing that benefited that was we negotiated with them to allow people to sign a waiver so that effectively they could come into us, sign a waiver, which meant that we could then communicate directly with with MSD about what their income was rather than them having to travel across the road and come back with the information. So that's been really useful. And we're just trying to get them to allow us to hold on to that waiver and be able to do it on an ongoing basis.
I'm just thinking at this stage of the day that we might not go into all the different levels of detail. There's heaps of it here in terms of the different areas of the district, the different options that we're proposing, how many people will have an increase, how many people will have a decrease, residential, rural, and the different graphs to show you what's happening in the different spaces. I think I'll leave it with you at this stage to go through, probably not in your Christmas holidays, um, and then we'll get into it in more detail um, at Christmas. Well, well I think actually, actually that's probably um, a good time for us to set their homework for the Christmas holidays because what would be really helpful <laughs> is, did I sound like a school teacher then? I'm married to one. Um, what would be really, really helpful is prior to the workshop on the 25th of January, um, we have a three-hour workshop and before we're taking you on a site visit around the district. We anticipate that at least two of those three hours is completely focused on this rates conversation because we kind of need to move into some ideas into some actually landing, well, what are we going to do or what aren't we going to do and take you through that, um, what is kind of picking up on Councillor Allen's point earlier around um, it's quite a... Um, there's a, there's a clear process we need to go through in terms of some particular questions we need to ask of ourselves. And so ideally, you will have read all of this before that workshop. Um, you will have checked in with Jacinta if you have any particular questions in advance of that um, and taken the time to understand the different options and how those different options might impact ratepayers. Is that fair? Yep, and we'll have for you as well, we've looked at top 50 rate pairs, top and then bottom 50 rate pairs, and just looked at the impacts of the different decisions and what that has on those on those different groups. If there's other particular groups or certain questions or options that you want us to make sure are included, please let us know and we'll try and make sure that that's ready. Just into, presumably after that workshop next yeah, there is also a sort of almost a do nothing option, right? Because I know that collective members pushed for this to be included as part of the amendment. But just sitting here reflecting, other than some big impacts on certain communities as a result of um, the valuation impact, which potentially we could deal with in a, in a, in a, in a particular way, but um, in Come the LTP proper, we're obviously dealing with a really different outlook as well because there's no three waters. We won't be rating for, for any three waters stuff. So I just wanted to clarify that there is potentially a sort of a decision point after the workshop. Actually, mm, the, the scale and the scope of changes could actually be quite limited for the LTP amendment and that we might want to hold off some stuff. That can absolutely be a decision of the table if you would change your mind in terms of you looked at the analysis, you've looked at the impacts of the valuation changes and you decide that you would not like to progress further with the rates review at this time. That's absolutely your decision to make. There's nothing set in stone around it needing to occur um, with this amendment. But to, to uh, Ross's earlier point around, you know, when we tried to do the whole shift to capital back then, but, you know, piece by piece, you know, it's actually palatable, well, in comparison to then. Um, I'm prepared to, or, and I'd like to continue down this path and see what these um, the modelling looks like um, for part of a rate review and switching from land to capital value on some of these options. Um, but, um, my question was about, um, you asked what else would we like to see. I know you've mentioned you're going to um, compare it to the, the affordability work you were doing in the S1. and the, well, I'm keen to, to get back to, the, there was a map you showed and there were a couple of red sections like Queenwood Road in another corner and then some in Foxton. Um, I want to see how that all shifts. Yeah. Absolutely. So for those areas, 
for those red areas, I would envisage for those you would see the median. We, we can't give you any more than the median household income for those because that's all we've got. But there's absolutely we could absolutely give all of the property information, property by property, not with the details of people, but show you exactly what those different options would do to impact that particular area. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is if maybe tomorrow afternoon we'll do a bit of a recap email out to elected members that is uh, this is where we've got to around long-term plan, landfill, three waters, this is where we've got to around rates, this is where we'll need to get to for end of January and here's your homework. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'll remind you in weekly words, which will resume on Tuesday, the 24th of January. No, Monday's a, Monday's a public holiday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we'll just quickly cover off a little bit about the process um, this starting um, in 2023. So um, we will be preparing the consultation document and supporting information. Um, it will um, be coming back uh, with the options and the preferred options that you have indicated and that um, comes back after the homework um, that um, feeds in through that as well. So um, we'll skip that one because that's the homework one. <laughs> um, and the timeline until adoption. So building on this one, January is the drafting, but January is also starting with the early engagement. And what we're working on and what comms is really doing a lot of work on at the moment is some early work on videos that um, Mayor Bernie and Monique went out to talk to school children um, about what um, council does and what a long-term plan is. And so they're working, um, comms is working that up. They're also doing some work on um, the evidence base for this, for telling the story. Um, drawing together, you know, what the rain events do, doing some maps um, and, we'll, and some videos there as well about what big storm events do. So that really helps us with the narrative and set the story to help explain to the community about why we're doing what we're doing. And um, the other part in January will be the work um, on the videos that um, you've been approached about on key topics as well. Um, I just wanted to highlight on this slide that as we progress through um, into consultation and then in the hearings part, that um, the lead up to this is where we will be circulating all of the submissions um, and so that it will be a really busy time for you in the lead up to that, um, working through all of the submissions ahead of the hearings in May. Um, and then that takes us close to the to the end point of adoption in June. Finish. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Jacinda. There's a huge amount of stuff that you've obviously been working on over the last few weeks. It's um, uh, quite incredible, actually. Um, but, you yeah, know, really good to have it presented like that. It certainly makes our life easier. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, far out. We've even finished half an hour early. Four minutes at 5.30.